in sporting events and also on television, you used to see this quite frequently. You still see it some. What you see is somebody standing in the background holding a sign. Written on it is one verse from Scripture. One verse from Scripture. And the reason why this Scripture passage is put on there, presumably, is that if somebody were to be inspired to open up the Bible, to take a look at one place and look up this one passage, they would capture so much of the core of what it means to be a Christian and who Jesus is. Today we hear that verse, John 3.16. John 3.16. There used to be a guy and he used to have like a big, he might still be around, I don't know, he had like a rainbow wig and he would hold up a sign, say John 3.16. Here's that passage. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. This, on this Holy Trinity Sunday, gives us so much of the core of what we believe as Christians. And today on Holy Trinity Sunday, we reflect on the role of the Trinity, not just as an abstract reality, but how it is that the very life, the communal life of the Trinity is something that we are drawn into and the saving action of God, Father, Son, and Spirit changes us and changes how we treat other people. The beauty and the simplicity of this one passage. Now let's take a minute and reflect upon the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so hang with me for a little bit. This is kind of, you know, diving out into the theological waters. Uh, from all eternity, the Trinity existed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In fact, at the very creation account, it says, in our image, in our image, were human beings created, that this sense that there wasn't just a unitary, single, but our image. So from all time, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existed. And so what we understand, if we look back at what St. Thomas and St. Augustine said, that God the Father sent forth Jesus and the love that exists between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son sent into the world. One God, three persons. And so what this means is that from all eternity, there is this beautiful relationship within God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father pours everything into the Son, the Son gives His Spirit fully back to God the Father, and the love between them, we used the word, it, it spirates, it's like it spirals out, and that's the Holy Spirit. Now, it's significant to note that this is unlike other belief systems. The notion of a God that is love in a relationship within the very being of God is extraordinary, it's beautiful. It's revolutionary. And we can understand that what this means is that for us as Christians, we are called to be in that relationship. We hear in the book of Exodus this passage. So Moses has this beautiful encounter with God. It says, Moses at once bowed down to the ground in worship. Then he said, if I find favor with you, O Lord, do come along in our company. This indeed is a stiff-necked people, yet pardon our wickedness and sins and receive us as your own. This kind of intimacy with God. So basically, Moses has this incredible encounter with God, and then he says, you know, we're, we're pretty stubborn folks, but we'd love to be with you. Will you come along with us? 
And that's what God does. That's what God does. And so the action of the, of the Trinity in this simple passage, we're saying that, you know, God created the world in perfection. He intended us to be in a beautiful, loving relationship with each other and to follow his plan. But we, in essence, said thanks, but no thanks to God. So we said, you know, in the garden, this is beautiful, this is, this is great, but we want to do things our own way. So we're going to turn away from you, God. And so what happened is that original sin meant that the world as perfection was intended was corrupted. So something got out of whack. The perfection that God created out of love for us, we distorted with our own free will. So God never stopped loving us. So he sent the prophets, he entered into a covenant with us, he reminded us of how we should live, and yet we were not able to do that. And so Jesus is sent into the world to do what? Because the consequences of that disorder is that the death that we were never to have experienced suddenly came into the world. And so Jesus comes, we're told, to that the world might be saved through him, that somehow we're trapped and we're in need of, of being saved. We're trapped in our sins, we're trapped in the cycle of death. And so Jesus comes and lives the perfect life that none of us could. Jesus comes and lives the will of the Father in its entirety. Jesus comes and then takes all of our sins upon himself. He put to death, rises again. So when we believe in him, we have eternal life. Out of love, God sent Jesus. The goal of our life is to respond to Jesus by believing in him, and the pathway to eternal life is opened up for us. Jesus, when he ascends into heaven, then sends forth his spirit. That's what we celebrated at Pentecost yesterday. And so those imperfections, the death that would await us, now we are able to join into relationship with the Trinity and have life everlasting as it was intended for us. So what does it mean to be pulled into this relationship with the Trinity? How does this relationship affect our life with God and with others? So it means that we are drawn into a community. Now this could be a little bit abstract. I remember one time, this was before I entered the seminary, there was, I was uh, kind of training around Europe. I'd finished grad school and, you know, gonna see what Europe is like. So you, know, you get a train pass and on you go. And I remember finding myself in a train car and there was a priest there, an older priest. And I happened to be there and two other young adults were there. We were all sort of fumbling through either English or a little bit of French. I don't speak French, but we kind of attempted it all in English. And so these two other young adults, they were basically questioning him. And one of the things that this priest said in response is he says, I am never alone. I'm never alone. I always have God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with me. He also said, I have my guardian angel and the Blessed Mother. He lived with this profound sense that the unity of the Trinity was, he was a part of that, you know? He was not alone. He was not alone. He was in relationship with others. When we think about that relationship too, what's beautiful is that we can see in God this fundamental equality, that the Father isn't greater than the Son, the Son isn't greater than the Father, the Holy Spirit isn't greater than all the other two. They have this distinctiveness, but this fundamental equality in their relationship. And so St. Paul, who uses the Trinitarian formula in 2 Corinthians today, he says, and this is sometimes one of the opening prayers, it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. So that's his greeting. He, he brings forth the Trinity when he greets other people and says, basically, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you. He also says, mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. 
it's not just that we've got this great relationship with God and so it stops there. We say, okay, God, you know, I love you, you love me, um, I believe in Jesus, end of story. That God is revealed to us in an intimate relationship affects our relationship with God and with each other. It brings forth a fundamental equality among us. Elsewhere, St. Paul says, in Christ there is no slave or free, no Jew or Greek, no male or female. That there is this fundamental equality in the Trinity and that the love of Jesus, the love of God, transformed our relationship with each other. Now we can take these terms for granted right now, but this was really quite radical in its day. Uh, what St. Paul says disappears would have been the most basic social divisions of the ancient world. Slave, free, Jew, Greek, male, female, the culture would have been stratified along those lines. And so St. Paul says in Jesus that doesn't exist. There's a, a fundamental equality in relationship that we have. And so what this means is that all have dignity, all have value, all have worth. And so threats to that dignity of a person are not just like bad things, they're against the very will of God. That if we carve up and create a world of injustice to each other, then we're not reflecting that fundamental love and relationship of the Trinity. This is radical stuff in its day and radical stuff to this day. So we promote and defend the dignity of every human life. It's, it's part of what it means to be a loving Christian. So we uh, reject those things that are intrinsically evil, you know, like they're just wrong in and of themselves. From the womb to the tomb, that innocent life in the womb that should never be taken because there's no right to take that life. Pope Francis reminds us that at the end of life we, we live in a, a throwaway culture, like we make people disposable. And so right now in the midst of COVID-19 we have so many people who are vulnerable, who are older, who are frail, and we have to be ever vigilant that we don't just discard them think that they're without worth. And today as we come here, we also confront another intrinsic evil. Racism isn't just a bad thing, it's evil, it's a sin. It just can't be justified. And so when we treat others as inferior based on the color of our skin, it's contrary to the moral order, it's contrary to the very love that God reveals to us in the Trinity. That fundamental equality that exists among the Trinity brings with it a fundamental equality among all of us because we're made in the image and likeness of God. And so threats against the dignity of the human person which are being revealed so clearly these days through the injustice of racism are to be objected to, to be remedied, to be made right. Now the beauty is, and this can sound a little uh, almost naive, but the better Christians we are, the more the world will reflect the love that God has for us. That a response to the challenges of our age is not to say, well, our faith doesn't have any answers for that, but rather to say that our faith indeed is the source of the answers that we're seeking for right now. There's an interesting trend that's happening these days. There are some committed atheists <laughs> committed atheists who are actually making an argument for Christianity based upon our moral teachings. 
who are actually saying that we need, even those who don't believe in God, sense that there is this need for us to return to a foundational principle. And they find the limits of atheism being that it can't provide some of these fundamental answers. An author uh, and columnist who's an atheist in recent years, he has started to warn that the, the decline of Christianity is a dangerous thing. Society faces three options. The first, he said, is to reject the idea that all human life is precious. You know, to say human life, precious, reject that notion. That's not the way we want to live. Or he says, another is to work furiously to nail down an atheist version of the sanctity of the individual. And, and atheism has not been able to do that. There's only one other place to go, which is back to faith whether we like it or not. You see, if we perhaps think of an image of a spaceman, a space woman, you know, out on a spacewalk, an astronaut, with that line of oxygen tethered to the source, and suddenly that were to be clipped, that person just spirals out into the darkness, cut off from the source of life. The Trinity pulls us in, doesn't allow us to be severed. The answer to the pain and the frustration is that God created us in his image and likeness. He calls us into relationship with him. And because of that relationship, we're to extend that love to others. It's time to say yes to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To live as we're called to live in the light of the love that he pours out for all of us. It's simple, but it's true. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.